It's a great feeling of knowing the best is yet to come. Giving you the best that we have. Giving you the best that we have. And we're making life better. Okay, I'd like to call the meeting to order and ask everyone to please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you, why should call the roll? Trustee Ash. Here. Trustee Bridenfall. Here. Trustee Daniels. Here. Trustee Flunder. Here. Trustee Maddox. Here. Trustee Rios. Here. And Trustee Townsend. Here. All right. Uh, item number three, approval or amendment of the agenda. It looks like we have. Is it two amendments? A couple of amendments. Okay. I move approval of the uh, agenda as amended. Second. Okay. okay. I have a motion to second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. The motion carries. Uh, item four, approval of minutes from the January 15th. Board of Trustees meeting. No move. Second. I had one. Um, All right, we have a motion and a second. Now we have a question or a question. Yeah, I just think something needs to be clarified. Um, Dr. Abby Jaffer made the report that we were going to replace acupunct ac yeah, acupuncture. Acupuncture. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe Dr. Wendell's going to do that for us. <laughs> the acupuncture was compass, I believe. Yes. And that was on page four. And then over on page five, we were questioning Dr. McDowell. And it indicates in there that we're switching from compass to acupuncture. We just need to switch that around. So it's oh, clear okay. that we're going from acupuncture to, to compass. So under Dr. McDowell's statements on page five, we need to switch that around. Down yes. the bottom, you see where it says this? Yes. yes. Oh, you see that oh yeah. yeah. I know where you yeah. Otherwise, that was what I'm trying. Thank you. All right. Accept that as a friendly amendment to the uh, motion. Second. All right. So we have the uh, the motion with the now friendly amendment as uh, as proposed by Dr. Daniels. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. The motion carries. Thank you, uh, Dr. Daniels. Audience to patrons or petitioners. Do we have anyone in the audience this morning that would care to address the board? Yes, please. Step to the podium and give us your name and address for the record, please. And we welcome you. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Cynthia Payne. I live at 4428 State Line Road, Kansas City, Kansas, 66103. Thank you. Um, I moved to Kansas City on December 1st from Denver, Colorado as a member of the Homes for Hackers in Kansas City Startup Village. My startup is Cyber Jammer. It's a subscriber service that facilitates high, uh, high quality audio connections between people who want to perform music together in real time over the internet. The audio application I'm using is optimized for gigabit networks, but can be used over slower networks. Last week, I came to Kansas City, Kansas Community College, and did some preliminary testing over your existing campus network from room 3619. And while it was somewhat successful, there were significant spikes in latency, and this caused glitches and dropouts in our musical uh, data. This could be improved significantly with Google Fiber's gigabit speeds. And with the improvements, I would like to offer Kansas City, Kansas Community College students a workshop to learn more about the practice of music collaboration over the internet and so that KCKCC students might lead the way in this new technology. It is my understanding 
that Google is offering KCKCC one IP on their fiber network. And there are questions about the usefulness of a single IP. I would like to suggest and request that KCKCC bring the single IP into room 3619 so that I can do my workshops and teach the students about this cutting edge technology. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. B b before you leave, uh, <laughs> does anyone uh, have any questions? Baz, I'm, I'm sure you'll interpret that for us here at some point in time. <laughs> and uh, uh, Cynthia, please, uh, would you, uh, do, do we have your contact information, uh, maybe uh, email address or phone numbers? Okay, all right, good. Okay, so you're already hooked up and you're already wired there. Any questions, anybody? For I just have a comment. I, I, I think that Hacker Village out there opened up some opportunities for the college. Yes. Uh, there's a number of opportunities out there. I think they're going to be looking for places to do work, to house programs. To uh, and I just think it's an opportunity that we might have at the college to to work with people like Mrs. Payne to. Uh, to enhance what we're doing as well as what they're doing out there. So thank you for coming. Thank you. Right. Anyone thank else? You thank you, Ms. Payne. Oh, excuse me. Your business name is what? Cyber Jammer. And this is so that people can. Where? Right now I'm at 4428 State Line Road at the Homes for Hackers in Kansas City Startup Village, soon to be historic Kansas City Startup Village. Yes. All right. Thank, thank you, Ms. Payne. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Are there others? Seeing none, then we'll move on to uh, item six, communication. Uh, Mr. Chair, the one communication we have, I sent it to you uh, with the board letter. Mm -hmm. So that was the extent of it. Okay, all right. I'm, I'm going to uh, presume everyone had an opportunity to see it then was in the packet. Any questions or comments? All right. Item 7, the President's Report. Thank you. One of the most exciting things we uh, did since the last board meeting was to attend the PTK Legislative Day. And that was in Topeka on last Thursday. Um, it was different this year because the the K board meeting was changed so that students with the presidents could visit the legislators uh, in their offices. But because that was not clearly communicated, some of the presidents, some of us were not able to coordinate all of that uh, by the time we found it out. But I talked to Stacy Tucker, and for sure next year we'll have that plan so that if they bring their families with them or uh, they come with an advisor or all of us can visit the legislators and we can spend time with them. <clears throat> However, what did happen was there were 11 students that were invited down on the floor and it was so exciting because one of our students, uh, uh, Dylan Sack, was uh, one of the 11 that was invited down of all the students. So that was wonderful that one of our students was, was participating in that. Then we had the, the, the luncheon at the Ramada Inn, and uh, Dr. Daniels uh, was there, um, Dr. McDowell was there, um, um, who else did I take? Uh, Dean Hunt was there, the two students were there, Stacy Tucker was there, and Dr. Aga Jaffer was there. <laughs> so, so we were real, well represented to support our students, and uh, Brittany, Ball was the second student. Then we had the KACCT COP uh, meeting, and there were several things that uh, we discussed, but the most significant ones had to do with the uh, items before the legislature, and particularly the, the conceal and carry are HB 2055 and SB 186. Uh, we're concerned about gun control on the campus. We talked about it with, um, with, with some members of KBOR and we talked about it among ourselves and 
our, our point is, or what we will be arguing or what we'll be suggesting with our legislators is that they offer an exception for colleges, that we don't have to allow guns on our campuses. Because it, it does look in many cases, as we talk to the, legislatures, the legislators, that um, it will probably pass. Um, the presidents um, agreed that, um, this, that so far we're excited about the budget that's been presented because there are no cuts included for community colleges at this time. However, we do not think that it will continue in that way. Because of the many concerns about community colleges and the questions about what we're doing from the legislators and, and from KBOR uh, about what we're doing, we discussed the, the, the need to develop and define ourselves, develop a collective vision for community colleges. And so we'll be doing that. Um, we believe that people don't understand that in many cases, community colleges are not a, just a pass through to a four year degree at a, at a university or a college that uh, awards bachelor's degrees. So we need to uh, ourselves let the legislators know uh, exactly what it is that we do because we need to get credit for our students who come to prepare themselves to work and may not end, in many cases does not end in a degree but in a certificate. And many times they can go to work after they, they take a few classes, they are prepared and they are hired. So that's one of the challenges that we have in order to have that counted. So the suggestion is that for one of our meetings we bring with us uh, uh, our deans our who are our statisticians, those who deal with our data, so that we can actually share with them the kind of data we need in order to validate the statements that we're making. So that was very, very interesting. So I'll probably be taking uh, Dr. Min with me to one of our meetings so that we can have a real good discussion about that. Today I'd like to remind the board about the athletic director forums. Uh, starting at 1 p.m., there will be three in room 2705 in the nursing uh, building, and I believe I put that in your letter, too. Uh, so we're going to do that, and there are three candidates that we'll be interviewing, and all of you are invited to come and ask questions and to listen to them tell us their vision for the athletic department uh, if they are the person who is selected for the position. Uh, that ends my report. Thank you very much. Okay, other comments or questions? I had one, and I don't know if this is the appropriate place or not really, but last month we had a uh, Mr. Paul Bowman come and share a bunch of information with us. And we indicated would there would be some follow-up regarding that. Do you know, has there been any follow-up, or should I? We Mr. Bowden, I talked about it. He would probably like to speak to it. Okay, good. You want to do it now, Brian, or sure. did, uh, um, had you planned in your report? No. I didn't know anything. Um, okay. We have looked at uh, what Paul said about um, our salary being lower. Um, it's true. We've known that. Um, Chief Schneider would, would uh, certify to that. Uh, our, I, not so much that our beginning salary is so low. Uh, it seems that officers who go, new officers who go to work in Kansas City, Kansas and or Overland Park or the other places, after they get a year under their belt, they get a significant um, bump in, in their pay and our officers don't. And so the point about our officers making less money um, is true. Chief Snyder's car, him and I are working out something on um, right now. Can he keep his fleet mobile? Can he keep his officers in a vehicle um, if he does, in fact, take one home? And I told him to get his eye on the state patrol's used car list um, as they turn in some more vehicles um, to look at a vehicle like that. Um, interior lights and all the things that make that vehicle an official police vehicle but don't make it stand out on the road like he's got one parked or an expensive option 
um, we're looking at how we can we can deal with that um, there is more reporting that um, the admin assistant does there um, however it's um, consistent with more reporting that everybody's had to do um, with other things and chief and I are looking at her duties and what she's doing and and we'll look down the road and see where that goes but we are addressing them um, I got all the the pay scales from the local communities on on <coughs> what they start officers at and we're a couple thousand dollars low and it's not and like I said it's not that first um, thing that's so bad yeah. it's that after As they've been in steps. a year yeah. if they get a two or three thousand um, dollar bump for having survived the wrong that's the wrong term having prospered for their first year as an officer um, they get a three thousand dollar bump that's when we fall behind we lost an officer that went to go to be a jailer at Johnson County uh, he's gonna make more money being a sheriff's jailer than he was after a couple of years here as an officer yeah. so okay. um, now we have addressed some of the issues he talked about about other things we've we put on extra officers we have yeah. um, you know we have three that were um, just getting hired right now and so we're addressing those issues but Good. the bad part is most of our officers are working 12s um, 12 hour shifts and so to, to keep up with all the things that we do yeah. and our our footprint obviously is going to expand expand yeah. Okay, I think we appreciate the follow-up. That was, Thank you know, you. I think our <coughs> concern, and sounds like you guys are right on it. So, thank you very much. Okay, um, we ready to move on? All right, let's go to item number eight: personnel. We'll hear from Dean Marks. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Let's draw your attention to the personnel report. <laughs> Number eight, for your information, 8A, 1 through 4, and I'm asking for your approvals for items 8B, 1 through 25. Uh, before uh, we get to that, on, under human resources uh, report, um, I saw that uh, you assisted uh, on the uh, selection committee for KU's vice chancellor of the Edwards. Center. Yes. I was just wondering if you learned uh, something from their process to assist us in our hiring process. I believe so. Um, we'll be uh, uh, using uh, some of the techniques that uh, I learned over there uh, through that process. Uh, one being uh, the way we organize our forum. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll be doing the same for the forum for the VPAA position also. Okay. And then uh, uh, my <coughs> second question, it talked about the wellness committee sponsoring the presentation in March. I was wondering if that was just, uh, who's the audience target there? Is that all inclusive, for, including community, or is it just for staff? Or, for or employees, students? for employees. Just for the employee? Yes. Um, is there an opportunity for that to be opened up? I, the reason it, it was it, I was interested, uh, caught my attention is, you know, the uh, health uh, concern with, uh, in the community. Uh, Wyandotte County is rated very low in the state. It's no longer the lowest, but it's it went up a couple of counties. Uh, but um, so there's a concern, and if we have some information, if we already have a a form uh, is, would it be too cumbersome to open that up uh, I, I will certainly pass that along to the committee um, I, I can't see why it should really be a problem but I'll advise them and let them take it from there okay that that's right. your recommendation I, I think it would be good yeah. if, it, if it's feasible for it to be opened up Dean Marks I had a question also I see you served on the a selection committee for the athletic director's position yes uh, who, who who else was on the committee um, Debbie Baker the uh, soup the uh, secretary in in athletics um, Linda Sutton director of student services uh, Ryan was the chair mm -hmm. and uh, Steve Burleson, Steve baseball Burleson. coach. Coach Burleson. 
Thank you. Chairman, mm -hmm. I had a question. Do I have the secretary's son when it's the position in where that person is hired to be the Yes. <coughs> that has been our practice. We'll have uh, an administrative assistant, the administrative assistant for the vice president on that committee also. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Don't I have a question? Yes. Leota, in your <coughs> human resources report, you talked about uh, you completed the review of non-exempt employees, and you talk about that those rated excellent will, re will receive 16 hours of, me of merit. Yes. Could you tell us what that means, 16 hours of merit? What, how does that, does that translate into money or hours off? Hours off. Hours off. Yes. Okay. Uh, that's for the non-exempt uh, employees okay. who uh, receive the highest rating on their evaluation. And if they do earn that, they are eligible to receive 16 hours of merit time that they can take off within the next year. Within the year. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <clears throat> Move approval of the uh, recommendations under 8B. Second. Okay, is there any question or comment regarding the motion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 <clears throat> any opposed? Okay. Motion carries. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dean thank Marks. You. <coughs> okay, we are ready now to hear from uh, the Vice President for Academic Affairs, Dr. Aga Jaffer. Thank you very much. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce today uh, three faculty who have been, um, uh, that I'm recommending for the <coughs> sabbatical for next year. Um, we used to just have two positions for sabbatical, and then a couple of years ago in negotiations, faculty asked us to increase it to three positions. So we have three applicants today. They have gone through, their proposals have gone through the process of approval by the sabbatical committee. And I have reviewed their proposals, and I am recommending them for your approval. Um, I'd like to ask them to come up one by one, and I'll begin with Mr. Jerry Pope. If Jerry, if you could come forward. Jerry is a faculty member in the music department. He's been with us since around 2003, if I'm not mistaken. And he is requesting a sabbatical for spring 2014. Uh, to work on a full piano recital. Jerry, if you'd like to share some information. I think you've also got information in your packet on each of these sabbaticals. If you'd like uh, to just talk. Sure, absolutely. Um, it's kind of a three-pronged proposal, I suppose. The first is to learn a full-length piano recital. A classical piano recital, uh, it's very typical for us to perform the music from memory. Uh, which is a considerable amount of time to actually spend, you know, spend time learning that music from memory. The typical length is 75 minutes of music, so that's, that's kind of my goal. Uh, another um, reason for doing this was to do some more extended research that I can use in my music appreciation courses. Uh, one idea that I've been considering uh, is, for example, the fugue form is a form, I won't go into this very much, but it's a form that's been around since the 1700s. It was used in all periods of musical history, and I think it would be an interesting uh, project to um, not only learn and perform a fugue from each of those periods, but also to be able to write about it and share that perspective in my music appreciation class. And then the final, um, uh, well, actually, a third component of this project would be to work with our audio engineering group and produce, if not the entire recital in a recorded format, then certainly portions of it. Um, so Dr. Corbin and I, Dr. Ian Corbin, have talked about this, and it's very feasible. Uh, it would allow us to take advantage of our new location for the audio engineering program, as well as allowing me to have a uh, final copy or a product, if you will, of that sabbatical proposal. Uh, some places it could be used uh, would be, as I'm thinking, perhaps on the website. You know, I know a lot of uh, music departments have recordings of their, you know, their faculty members on their website, so that would be very interesting, uh, interesting to do. Uh, it'd be interesting to share it with you all, too, so I'm looking forward to that. Um, so basically, as I put together this proposal, I was trying to find a way to um, improve my own uh, 
skills as a pianist. It's very difficult to consistently practice the amount of time that's necessary while I'm teaching and holding down committee assignments and so forth and so on, but also be able to integrate that as much as possible into the classroom. So I was very excited about the possibility of sharing this information in the form of program notes and then to have a final product in a recorded format. So I'm very excited about the possibility. All right. Questions? Yeah, Comments? Jerry, how do you see this impacting on your students? Well, I th in a number of ways, I suppose. One of the ways is every time I perform in class, you know, I give excerpts of music that we're studying, especially in my music theory class, students constantly say, are you going to perform a recital? Are you going to do a more full-length recital? And so until now, I've said, well, no, I don't really have time to do that. So that would be one very exciting way. Uh, the other way, the forms that, that I'll do without getting too technical, there's certainly forms that we cover in my final <coughs> semester of music theory. So this would give them an opportunity you know, for me to, to share more information, you know, I suppose, about these forms. And then the fugue form especially would be very interesting in the music appreciation. It's kind of an arc of a form that's been around for 300 years. And interestingly, still is used in some forms of jazz music, believe it or not. So I think that's how. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, okay. I respectfully request your approval for Jerry Pope to have a sabbatical for spring 2014. Move approval. Second. All right, we have a motion and second. Any other comment or question? Mm -hmm. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Congratulations. Congratulations, Thank you very much. Jerry. Congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, it's, I just wanted to make a comment. I think that this is very significant in regard to uh, the importance of the arts is emphasized in, in this. And uh, uh, I think that this is something that can be important, not just for this institution, but into our uh, transferring universities. Uh, you know, I, I, I've talked to the board about the pipeline that I feel that we have for our music uh, programs. Um, and so I think this raises it up a notch. So I really am very appreciative of your request and I look forward to the results. Okay, um, the next person I'd like to ask to come up is Tom Weiss. Tom is a uh, professor in the uh, Department of English, and he is requesting a sabbatical to work on, to conduct research on Kansas history, including the history of his farm, and he's hoping to publish some articles on rural living in Kansas. Tom? Uh, yeah, um, I take it you've read my proposal. Um, it basically boils down to three um, writing prompts for me. The first one, and the one that will require the most research, is to look at the historical significance of my farm, which is in Jackson County, Kansas. Um, it happens to be at the crossroads of a lot of interesting history in, in the state. Um, uh, first of which was that uh, local lore has it that it was once a federal outpost. And as a federal outpost, um, it served as a liaison between the Potawatomi, or the Prairie Band of the Potawatomi tribe, and the federal government. And so um, this gives me an opportunity to go and to uh, have a, a reason, I suppose, to reach out to the Potawatomi Band and talk to them, and, uh, and also to go into Fort Leavenworth. Uh, there's a military museum there where I can do research on historical records. Um, farm has uh, had several owners over time. I've had a uh, few former faculty members who've come out and actually um, found artifacts on the property that was, was kind of surprising to me. Uh, one um, current adjunct here who teaches in anthropology uh, reached down the creek bed and picked up a scraper from a uh, Native American um, scraping tool for furs and whatnot. At any rate, that's uh, the first essay that I'm interested in uh, researching. And um, the second one, essentially looking at rural life. Uh, <coughs> since 2008, when I came into possession of the farm, I've gotten to know a lot of my neighbors. And I mean, as any uh, observer of you know, 
American culture, we see that there's a conflict between rural and urban people in many ways. I see it in my own classroom. And so to explore that and uh, for me to have a, a better understanding of rural people, uh, how they live, the things that they confront on a day-to-day -day basis, that's important to me. Um, it's important that I can serve as a kind of moderator between students in my own classroom. We explore the issue of nature and how to utilize nature, how to live on the planet in a, I don't know, in a sustainable, friendly way. But there are many, uh, there are many conflicts, there are apparent conflicts between cultural groups, and I want to write about that. I want to explore that. The last, uh, the last essay really has to do with the, the notion of solitude and, and uh, I don't know, being alone in nature. And I see that uh, it's t students can barely restrain themselves for 50 minutes without going to a handheld device in my classroom, and let alone to spend uh, 24 hours in a, in a wild place uh, to be in nature. Um, there's a disconnect, and I would like to write about that. Um, so basically, it boils down to these three essays and my chance to do research on the historical significance of the farm and to uh, further explore some of the issues with the conflict between urban and rural, and then to look at this last issue, which um, I don't know, it comes a lot from my own experience and dialogue with my students. So, thank you. Okay. Questions? Yeah, comments? same question, uh, Tom. How do you see this impacting on your classroom with your students? Oh, I thought that was coming. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, for one, um, as I said earlier, uh, we do have a, a contingent of rural students who come into our classroom all the time. Oftentimes, they're a minority in our classrooms, and they're, the values and, uh, and what they bring to a classroom is, is unique and special. and. Uh, in many ways, as we, especially in my Comp 2 classes, uh, we discuss nature and how to live in nature in harmony is basically the question that uh, raises one of our, the key components of the class. Their perspective is different than my urban students. And to somehow bridge that divide is really <coughs> what I hope to accomplish with that part. Um, the other part is, is purely, I guess, selfish in the sense of doing research on uh, Northeast Kansas. It's uh, my adopted home, and um, I think it could be significant. Uh, what I find there, I just feel fortunate to have come into possession of this property that, well, it might be more significant than, than I even uh, realize. I, I want to explore that. Thank you. When yeah, is this current uh, current production form? My essays, my writing, or the farm, farm. is it is all oh, the farm is a current a current production farm. It um, I have thirty. It's an eighty acre piece of property, and I have thirty acres in in hay. Uh, so I I basically get a I have a har a farmer, and I work in conjunction with that. Mm -hmm. No animals. I can't I can't be there twenty four seven to have animals, but I'm. I'm working towards that. At some point, I will. All right, thank you. I hope. How long have you been playing the country? Say again? How long have you been playing country? Playing? <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> good question. Um, I came into possession of the property in 2008. So um, that's the beginning of my education, to be honest. And uh, uh, I'll say one thing about it in that basically those people who can make a living on the land have my utmost respect because it's no easy thing to do. Um, just the basic things, uh, um, clearing brush, getting enough firewood for a, for a season, things like that, uh, gives you a new appreciation for how, you know, what our ancestors went through in order to settle this land. So. Mm -hmm. I want to congratulate because I, I'm intrigued with bringing this discussion even further before in, a, in an urban setting, particularly with issues of, of climate change and drought uh, in Kansas and how that affects the economy and affects us all. So I, I, I'm really looking forward to, to hearing more about that. Well, thank, thank you. you. Yes, I, I agree. Uh, it's, uh, <coughs> this proposal is unique and it's multifaceted. 
and it's actually very well written. Uh, your proposal. I, I He's want a to commend you. Teacher. He's I an want English <laughs> faculty. Uh, so, uh, so, so I, so I guess it was supposed. Oh, see everybody, <laughs> see how the high expectation. Uh, <laughs> but it really, I, I did en enjoy reading uh, that. And with that, I move approval. Second. Recommendation. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any other discussion or question? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Congratulations, Tom. Congratulations. So We're looking forward to seeing your work. And um, last but not least, I'd like to ask Janet Velasquez to come up. Janet is um, business faculty, and she is requesting a sabbatical for spring 2014 to do research on the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals policy and its implication on our students. She also plans to work at, with El Centro on immigration issues. Janet. Thank you. Thank you. Um, one of the things that I have noticed, and I'm sure you all have too, is the increase uh, in minorities, and especially Hispanic minorities. And I've watched it in my classroom over the last few years. It's come to the point where the last few years, the first question that I ask, because I teach primarily business law, and law in and of itself is almost like a second language. And so when I get students who uh, English is not their first language, then it's like a double impact to them. And when I started last fall semester, 40% of my class, uh, English was not their first language. And in fact, of that 40%, over 30% Spanish was their first language. And uh, this has been something that has um, been close to my heart for a long time, uh, I finally decided I needed to act on it. And I have some, I have some Spanish background, but it's, it's not, certainly not enough to be functional in the language. And so um, the current state of our immigration law is in flux. I am not sure that by the time I, I take my sabbatical, if you approve it in 2014, that we'll be talking about the same things that I've presented here. But it's certainly something that I am following and want to continue to follow. And uh, do it with enough, enough depth that it will have an impact on our student population. So that when they talk to me, so that when I communicate with them, I will be able to do it effectively. And more than that, to be able to reach out into the community. I have uh, contacted El Centro and, and been down there and visited with them as far as the possibilities. Uh, been to a couple meetings that they've had. It's not something that I can fit into my schedule right now on a consistent basis. Um, but there are lots of other opportunities in the community that where I see that this would be beneficial and useful. And especially as a business faculty, I think that with the international aspect, um, with our South American and our Central American connections, that having someone on the faculty who I'm not going to say fluent. I don't, I don't want to lead you to believe that I think I can be fluent in this amount of time, but functional in Spanish will be an assistance to our faculty and to our students. Okay. Questions? I'm not asking my question. I think your project is pretty apparent. Uh, it's going to impact on students. So. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's a great project. Thank you. Uh, this certainly is a hot topic, and uh, it's, a, it's a discussion at the local, state, and, and the national level. Uh, Marianne and I heard about it in Washington, D.C. last week on more than one occasion, and so uh, I think it's <laughs> apropos, and I think it's very, very timely right now. Just as a proof. point of inf information, I happen to serve on the uh, board of El Centro, so I am aware uh, of your uh, involvement to this point, and uh, we're very excited for the potential of partnership if uh, the board is so inclined. Thank you. Okay, Wendell has moved approval. I don't know if anybody second. heard it or not. And Marianne is second. Um, any further question or discussion by the board members? All right, we'll call the question. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Congratulations. Congratulations. Yeah, appreciate that. Thank, Thank you. Board. Thank you Excellent. very, very much. Great proposals. Thank you. Okay, it is now my pleasure to introduce our new project manager for the T4E grant, 
and she's with us today, Ms. Natasha Elskari. Uh, prior to joining KCKCC, Natasha served as Project Director for Upward Bound at UMKC for about 10 years. <coughs> so she's had extensive experience working on federal grants. She's received her MA from UMKC in Liberal Studies with a concentration on Women and Gender Studies. Yay, Kathy. <laughs> and African American Studies and Creative Writing. Um, she is getting situated, she is learning about the grant and has become an invaluable member of the grant management team. And she's here to share with you some information about the grant and herself. Natasha? Good Welcome. morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, as Tamara said, my name is Natasha Ria Elskari and I am excited to stand before you today as a month old project manager of the T4E grant. Mm -hmm. um, I'm so excited to be a part of the Kansas City, Kansas Community College family. Each person I've met um, is equally as excited as I am about serving students through not only this grant, but the entire KCK Community College family um, and student body. My colleagues at the Tech Center have helped me to feel welcomed, and I'm learning the ropes between both campuses. So far, I've met weekly with the grant management team, and we've selected a marketing firm, Global Prairie. I've assisted with the completion of the quarterly report and the fiscal report interviewed and selected a part-time secretary and created a job announcement for the TTE coordinator position. In coming months, the selection committee will interview and select both full and part-time grant positions as we get ready for the big move in August. I come to you with a 12-year experience in grant writing and management with a focus on assisting underserved populations on higher education campuses. My professional and personal dedication to serving those that deserve a chance to achieve the American dream is really what leads me in my mind and heart and career. When I am not working this fantastic job, you will find me around the Midwest region performing original poetry, giving poetry workshops, and surely in the stands as a proud track cross-country basketball cheer, debate, science Olympiad, and dance mom. So <laughs> thank you uh, so much for having me. I'm excited about being here. Uh, first of all, welcome. Thank We're you. glad to have you on board. Could you talk a little bit more, Natasha, about some of your other uh, experience working with federal grants? What are some of the other grants, for example? Well, um, Upward Bound is the particular grant through the U.S. Department of Education, and so that is where I've spent uh, my career. I've assisted other organizations with grant research and writing on a need basis, um, smaller grants for smaller organizations within the community on the side, just as a as a way of knowing how to walk through um, long grant applications and understanding the language, uh, particularly of the Department of Education, which isn't so different from the Department of Labor. Uh, Department of Labor is actually a little less convoluted than the Department of Ed, so. Okay, thank you. <laughs> that was a good, interesting comment. <laughs> uh, I believe it too. <laughs> <laughs> um, you talked about a coordinator position. Could you give us a little more detail of what Absolutely. that individual will be working on? Um, the TTE coordinator will be responsible for working with the workforce industry to make sure our students are workforce ready. Um, in the grant proposal, we had uh, companies that promised letters of intent that they would assist our students once uh, they completed certificate programs. And so the TTE coordinator will be working directly with the workforce to make sure our students are in line with what their needs are within the industry. Could you remind us uh, who those partners, potential partners are? Um, yes, I know a couple off the top of my head. Let's see, we have Webco is one. Um, Cliff, can you remember? New Holland and... That's, those are the main two. Okay. And also possible internships while they're in the program as well. Okay. Will you be working with the internships for Cerner? Um, for Cerner? No. Yeah. Mm, will we be doing anything with Cerner? Since they say that they didn't hire but 100 from Wyandotte County last night. Um, or, 
Oh, wow. Well. No. Yeah, that would no, that that, that That's not related to this grant, yeah. Trustee Flint. Yeah. But we meet with Cerner in our career center constantly now and are working to provide them the students that have the requirements that Cerner requires. And we're trying to, we, we work on that constantly from our career center. Can okay. I ask if, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, yes. Uh, if you'll be connecting with our campus AAUW, I, I don't know if women and uh, non-traditional careers is, I, is a part of this, and I think they'd be, I think it'd be a great uh, relationship as they're kind of growing to be their own entity here at the college. Yes, actually, we, we spoke a little bit about that in a part of our um, best employability practices courses, including um, sensitivity training, because we are trying to attract women into non-traditional settings and giving them the, tr the support that they need, uh, particularly, I think it's welding is what we're the focus is of trying to pull more women uh, into the welding program. So I think that would be a great alliance. And, yes. Excellent. Okay. Where will you be housed? Will you be here or will you be at the tech? I'm at the technical center. The technical yes. Center. Yeah. And when we move to the new location in August, uh, um, Natasha will have her office at the TTE center great. over there. Good. All right. All right. Thank you very much, Thank Natasha. You. Thank you. Welcome. Have a good day. Thank Welcome. You. <laughs> okay. Um, I'd like to ask Dr. Marvin Hunt to come up. He wants to share some yes. information with you about the Innovation Summit, and I think you have information in your packet about that as well. Yes, we're excited to hear what's new for this year's summit. Thank you. Um, well, I would offer four words to start this presentation. Fragmented, disruptive, innovative, and exciting. Those are words I might use to describe entrepreneurialism as it is currently happening in our environment here in the Kansas City area and all over the country and perhaps the world. Um, you have a packet with, I think, four documents in front of you that talk about our second annual Innovation Summit. I, uh, I'm sure you've taken time to review that. I also have Jay Matlack here with me this morning who's helping lead our efforts to create the Innovation Summit, and he'll talk a little bit today, too. We're going to make this fairly short. but. Um, in the packet, you've got a save the date card. It's a blue card. Uh, you've got an overview of the event with kind of the who, what, when, where, why, and how. You've got an agenda, and then you've got some of the parameters of the pitch competition that is part of the event, kind of the core of the event. I'm going to tell you just briefly about the history and why we're doing this. Um, like I said, fragmented is one word I would use to describe entrepreneurialism. The, the community our community and the whole Kansas City metro area it wants to be entrepreneurial and wants to have a reputation as an entrepreneurial uh, area, and I think we are. But I think the resources, as we've analyzed them, has been fragmented. And we thought, after some analysis, and this is our workforce team, which is Jay and Marissa Gray, who's present today too, and we'd like to acknowledge Marissa's contributions uh, to this effort. Uh, we decided that one way to help uh, solve part of at least of the fragmented problem is to bring resources together here on our campus so that we contribute to the reputation of entrepreneurialism and help grow entrepreneurialism and wrap uh, services and support around the entrepreneurial uh, ecosystem. Um, the entrepreneurials have a voice and it needs to be heard and uh, it's creative and enthusiastic energy but it needs channels and it needs ways to uh, form uh, the individuals who who are entrepreneurial need to form their uh, voice and understanding of what they can do and so we had a long talk about this and decided to uh, to create the event and I was talking with Dean Ton at University of Missouri in Kansas City during an articulation agreement discussion and he said well you know why don't you have me come over and speak and we'll talk about uh, disruptive innovation and I said, well, what's a disruptive innovation? And he said, well, that's the way a new product comes into a market. It disrupts the market and stimulates the market. And I said, okay, Dean Ton, we'll take you up on that. And so he came over, and he was our keynote speaker last year at our first summit, and many of you, I think, were present at the summit. And we borrowed ideas from Tulsa University and uh, uh, Mountain View Community College to develop our summit last year. We we looked at how they did pitch contests where people do like an elevator pitch and sell their idea uh, to a panel of um, uh, 
venture capitalists and bankers and people like that who can help them establish their financial premise for their, for their uh, entrepreneurial venture. Uh, we identified partners like KC Source Link, Wyandotte Economic Development Council, the Kansas City, Kansas Chamber, the Black Chamber, UMKC, and others. We had a goal of 100 people attending last year, and we achieved that goal. Uh, we uh, had quite a lot of nice uh, outcomes from that in that two of the pitch people who pitched last year were awarded cash of a few hundred dollars. Uh, we've grown that, and Jay will tell you about this year. We really grew that amount this year with partner contributions. We had a small business loan connect to one of the people who pitched last year, so there was actually two formal relationships established where funding support became wrapped around their, their entrepreneurial concepts. Uh, an angel investor helped a second place person, which is a different process than a loan process. We had a blogger in Chicago talk highly about our event. Uh, other articles were uh, mentioned, they mentioned us, and I think we are getting a bit of a rep as a supporter of, of entrepreneurialism. Uh, and, and our sponsors and our partners were very satisfied and have really come enthusiastically to the second annual event. So Jay, would you step up and tell everybody about the second event? Yes. Good morning. Good, good, morning. Morning. good morning. So like any good students, we reviewed the Innovation Summit from last year, and we're happy with the successes from it, but uh, there's definitely ways we can improve as well. So we found three different ways we could improve for this year. Uh, one of them is we didn't reach the young entrepreneurs. Uh, they weren't represented at last year's innovation or uh, yeah, last year's innovation summit like we would like. So we're going to improve on that. Second is networking. We want more time where people can just collaborate. We realize that a lot of the great um, entrepreneurial activities and outcomes happened when people were talking with them with each other on their way out or during lunch. So we're going to try to create more of that atmosphere at this event. And then the third is just bigger bigger and better, a bigger stage. So uh, to do that, we've structured it a little bit different this year while still kind of keeping the core elements. So I'll quickly kind of go through the agenda for that day, and you'll see hopefully with that agenda and that structure how we address those three areas I just mentioned. So we'll start with the day. We'll have a keynote speaker, which we hope to announce here in a couple weeks, and then uh, we're going to highlight four uh, entrepreneurial uh, success stories that are occurring right here uh, in Kansas City. And then from there, we're going to go to what we call an elevator pitch exhibit. And this is going to be structured. It's going to be in Jewel. So we moved it from the PAC to Jewel so that it's more of an area where people can walk around and talk with each other. And it's going to be an exhibit structure. Um, we're going to accept 24 exhibits, so people who want to pitch. And they're going to do their 30-second elevator pitch of their idea. So short. Um, and then everybody who attends the Innovation Summit will get a fake currency, and they'll go to the 24 people there, the 24 exhibits, and hear the 30-second elevator pitch. If they like the idea, then you invest your fake currency in their little bank right there. Uh, then we will count up all the money, at the fake money. <laughs> and I'm sure they'll take real money too, but uh, <laughs> we'll count it up. And then the top 12 will then go to the perfect pitch competition. The perfect pitch competition will be the three-minute pitch, which is typically what you see, uh, the three-minute pitch in front of the venture capitalists and investors who have agreed to be our judges. Uh, what we've done to, uh, to, to address the getting the young entrepreneurs is we've created two divisions. So we'll have a general division, and then we'll have a, a high school division. So um, essentially six people in each of those divisions will do the three-minute pitch in front of the judges. And then the top three of each of those will be awarded a monetary value. The pitch competition is called Perfect uh, State Street Perfect Pitch Competition because State Street has agreed to uh, give five thousand dollars for uh, prize money for the for the pitchies. So a, a nice start and some nice uh, income for three minutes uh, of, of pitching. So um, then we will have a lunch ceremony where the winners will be announced, and then that. That's the event. Uh, one thing I would have mentioned that day is when we conclude at 1.30, we're then going to invite anybody who would like to down to the bookstore where we've created a new partnership with Workforce Development in the bookstore where students, faculty, and staff are able to sell new products that they have at the bookstore. We realize that there's a lot of entrepreneurs here in the, in, uh, the Kansas City, Kansas 
community college uh, community that have products that need to be launched and need to be tested. So we want to create that platform for them. So that'll be 130. We'll have a ribbon cutting with the KCK Chamber. So that's the structure of the event. The hopeful outcomes, of course, is funding. That's always a great, a great thing. There's the funding with the um, pitch award money, but there's also funding that we hope um, comes out from the conversation with the venture capitalists and the investors there. Second is key relationships. Uh, last year, there's a lot of mentorships that have developed um, from the Innovation Summit. Also, the relationships with the venture capitalists and the investors and the business leaders that will be there as well. And then third is creating this entrepreneurial ecosystem and a few examples of this. Uh, have you heard that there was this uh, di digital sandbox announcement that occurred, which is a, a huge thing with UMKC and this, the, big, um, the six biggest employers in Kansas City? Uh, last week they called us and they want to meet with us face to face, they said immediately, the director of digital sandbox, because they heard about the innovation summit and they think we can collaborate. This is a $10 million project where um, 10 businesses will be in this business innovation center at Union Station and get a million dollars each um, for two years in the business innovation center. And so they want to work with our innovation summit. Um, so we want to we want to create those relationships and continue to do so. We've worked with uh, Blue Valley Caps is going to have 12 of their uh, students come and participate in the innovation summit. And so those are the, the kind of re relationships we want to nurture. So with that, Marvin? Yeah, I would mention one other thing real quick, like uh, General Motors will be here too and they'll have some of their innovative cars out in our parking lot with the doors open and the hoods up and it'll be exciting because they're, as you know, they've invested, what, $600 million in their paint shop, so we're, they're, they're choosing us. We are, by the way, the sole education provider for them and we're over there quite a bit and we've got a new contract with General Motors too, so we're excited about that. So anyway, we want to realize our community's potential and uh, in terms of entrepreneurialism and the excitement around that issue and the growth that we can provide. So at this point, I think we're uh, willing to take any questions that you might have. Yeah, I had a couple more. Uh, one, you said uh, you're going to have some kids from Blue Valley come over. Are you going to advertise this in the local high schools, see if some local high school kids will show Definitely, up? Definitely, yeah. Yeah. Um, Wyandotte High School has 25 students that are coming to the Innovation Summit, oh, and they're also trying out for the pitches as well. In the Blue Valley CAP students, they, they still have to do the tryout before sure. they're allowed to pitch yeah. here, which is in March. Yeah. Uh, we've worked with Laura he Lori Hewitt at a USD 500, who's um, communicated it to all the, the schools. So hopefully, uh, we'll start to see more students want to uh, try out. I think the fact that the, the digital sandbox has reached out to you guys is pretty huge. Can you talk mm -hmm. a little bit more about what that might look like, how we might collaborate with them? Well, my meeting with them uh, is at 11 o'clock today. Okay. So <laughs> <laughs> I'll know after that. We'll wait for further yeah. developments. That's, that's right. Well, I think and that's then, great. Uh, I also failed to mention, too, um, a lot of the people that have signed up to pitch or try out to pitch, uh, there's been three of the, the startup village, um, the people that are in the startup village are pitching as well. So it's just great to see some of the things that are outside of the walls come in the walls and hopefully a lot of the great entrepreneurial activities in the walls coming out too so I'm um, just collaborating of the, of the two. These pitches can be startup pitches from the floor or they can be mid-development where people have a new line or some kind of product that they're launching as well. Well I just think the digital sandbox thing is, is potentially I mean that the impact on this community I think this whole region of that sandbox is it could be huge and I'm, really pleased to hear that we're uh, being approached by them to collaborate that's a that's a great yeah. thing well, I, thank you for doing that i agree and i always think it's good for us to uh assist the uh, county to the south in educating their young people <laughs> um, because somebody has to do it and i'm, I'm glad that we're able to accomplish that really it's, you know we want to reach across so keep that up and then one thing I didn't uh, miss to mention is BizFest as well. A lot of the people that participated in BizFest will be participating in our uh, pitch competition as well. Have you, have you uh, developed stronger ties with the Kauffman Foundation and their entrepreneurial initiatives? Well, in fact, uh, we are really working that uh, right now. You know, they've got new leadership, and we've uh, actually confronted them or, or asked them if uh, – they could provide a keynote speaker and we're I won't say much about that until we finish our 
negotiations and if that can happen. It seems like it might, but we'll have more news uh, soon about our keynote. But yes, we definitely want Kaufman's involvement. Did you have anything else about that? There's scholar program. Uh, a lot of yeah. their scholars are participating in the pitch competition okay. Okay. as well. And like you said, the keynote. And then we're, there's some other partnerships we're, we're working on too with them. Well, I, I was able to attend the, uh, the pitches uh, last year and, and that was really enlightening and enjoyable. I, hopefully I can participate again. Well, we hope year. you can. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. How are you, young man? <laughs> He's younger than you. Oh, I'm, I'm 27. <laughs> yes. All right, keep up the good work, young man. Thank you. So when Mary and Ann and I were in Washington last week, we had uh, breakfast one morning with a trustee from Milwaukee, uh, a community college in Milwaukee, and uh, she was talking about innovation, entrepreneurship. She and her husband own their own businesses and things, and she talked about uh, having difficulty finding a job, and someone then said to her, well, if you can't find a job, why don't you just create a job? Mm -hmm. And so I, certainly in this you know, environment that we're in here now in, in, the, in the United States. Uh, but particularly, I see a confluence of things coming together here, like such as Google and, you know, uh, Cyber Jammer and Flip Flap and, and those kinds of things. Uh, uh, it's where our young people are at. And I think uh, it, it, part of education is, is helping them understand that, well, you know, you could create a job too. If you want to come here, and get ready to get a job, we can do that for you. But if you want to come here and learn how to create a job, we can do that for you too. And I think it's exciting. That's exactly so. right. Uh, even our Department of Labor grant, our new TAC grant, there's an entrepreneurial dimension that the Department of Labor wants you to yeah. uh, fold into that grant. And so we've got the FLEET program, which is financial literacy, entrepreneurship, and essential employability skills. And you would say, well, didn't you want these people to get trained in technical areas so they can go get a job? That's true, but maybe that job is a self-employment job. And that, that's kind of a new twist at some of those, those kind of initiatives. So you're right, stints, working stints, doing contracts, and developing your own business are the way that I think many of our young people will just simply understand the work environment. Well, it's exciting, and we seem to be right out to the tip of the spear of it. So good work, and let's, let's keep it going. Let's keep it going. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, yep, I've got one more person I'd like to introduce, Dr. Brenda Kelly. She's the Director of Developmental Education, and she's going to be updating you on her activities. And in front of you, I have put a, a little booklet, pamphlet, and it's got a checklist that Dr. Kelly has prepared for you. If you want to pull that out, she, um, she'll go through it. This is, it's right here, this thing here. Okay? <coughs> Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. How's everyone? Hi, Great. thank you. I'm excited about this opportunity to share with you. Last time we were together, uh, I introduced myself and then shared some of the uh, activities that we want to engage in um, to help address the needs of our developmental education, students enrolled in developmental education courses. The checklist that is before you enables me to briefly go through some of the things we have accomplished since um, first semester. I came on board August 13th, and so here we are today, February 19th. Let's see what has been accomplished. And let me be clear that the checklist you have before you has listed on it on the side the advisory council. So when I speak of accomplishments, I don't speak of them in, as a solo effort. It has been the involvement, active involvement our, of our advisory council. So as you can see from the very beginning, um, in addition to the advisory council, we have worked very closely with the Center for Research uh, as well as uh, the IT department. So we've worked very closely with those individuals, those, those departments. I want to bring your attention to we did uh, establish our advisory council with the intent of meeting monthly, but I want to reinforce it was not just a meeting, but it was a working meeting. Every time we've come together, the documents you see before you, they've had input in their development of them. I present drafts uh, along with working closely with Dr. Aga Jaffer, and then the advisory council rolls back their sleeves and gets involved in the uh, uh, creation of these documents. 
Let me go through them quickly. It's the first one you will see is the uh, brochure. And the brochure describes the developmental education. I'll do a van of light. <laughs> the brochure describes the developmental education programs. Uh, but it does something in addition to that. It tells the students how you got here in terms of the, your performance on the mandatory evaluation and placement for this institution and how we have used that data to help support you in your educational experience here at the college. So uh, as you can see, we address the placement, the criteria, the student advising center, uh, what's available there for the student, as well as, as our mission. And then we have listed the courses and a brief description of the course, courses that students would take. And that brief description is not comprehensive, but it really does give the student an understanding of why we're asking them to take a particular course. It is based upon their performance on the AccuPlacer uh, placement tests. So that is the first document that we created. We will be creating another brochure and I will speak to it as we talk about progress. The second, um, uh, we have created a profile of the students that are enrolled in one or more courses, developmental education courses. Now the purpose for that profile is so that we might monitor students' uh, uh, performance as they are going through our curriculum. When I speak to the when we're monitoring their performance, it's not just for the purpose of tracking, but it's for the purpose of seeing how well we've helped them to perform in their developmental education courses so that they might be successful in our uh, traditional courses that we're offering. The uh, fourth item I have listed there is that we have submitted the information from our developmental education component to our strategic plan. We work collectively as, a, as an advisory group. Uh, went step by step through the uh, strategic plan in terms of what we're going to be able to do for addressing the needs of our students enrolled in developmental education courses and submitted that in a timely fashion to uh, Dr. Gibbons. Uh, let's see. Then going on down, we prepared um, from that if strategic plan, we prepared our own work plan in terms of what did we as an advisory council want to accomplish within the uh, current academic year. And we're using that as a guide and we're right on track, in fact maybe a little bit ahead on a couple of the items of what we wanted to accomplish, accomplish in terms of serving our students. Um, the next item you'll see there is that we participated in uh, the faculty in-service workshop that was on January 8th. That workshop was uh, designed to have an interaction between each of our faculty members as it related to uh, addressing the diverse instructional needs in their classroom. The uniqueness of that uh, workshop was the interaction. The faculty working together in different small groups, we had put before them about a, a group of about eight questions and had them to give some instructional strategies that they would use in their particular classroom setting. Um, we, you will, well, they, many of them voiced uh, their appreciation for being involved versus just um, uh, being told what they will find to be the best uh, teaching practices. And then the next item I have is that we created the student needs assessment and that's the one I've noticed several of you have read or looked at and it looks like this. But the student needs assessment really is the, uh, the bank of work that we have done this semester. Uh, this particular document you're looking at was emailed to each of our students and with the student, I'm sorry, was emailed to each of the students with the intent of uh, getting them to tell us about three things in summary. One, why are you here? What do you want from this educational experience? And then how can we help you acquire that? Um, so knowing the students' goals, we were able to determine are you uh, enrolled for uh, securing an AA degree or certificate? Uh, perhaps maybe you're just repeating a course you didn't do well at another institution in. But we wanted to know what are your goals? And then we wanted to know when do you plan to accomplish that goal? So the, the, this assessment that you have before you attempts to get the answers to that question. Then we asked the student, and beyond your uh, goals, what are some particular challenges you might experience? And the challenges are like, we've listed about 12 in housing, 
uh, perhaps employment, money, transportation, child care. There are a few others, and then we allow them a place to write in any other uh, challenges that they may encounter. And we pose that question with the intent of being able to answer the student and say, based upon your survey, we are aware that you've indicated that transportation may be a concern. And so I will send them, we will send them, uh, that particular person an email about what's available in transportation. But that also represents our second brochure that we're in the process of preparing. And that is we're vetting different uh, entities here on the campus as well as in the greater Kansas City area. Like what's available to our students in the way of housing, what's available to our students in the way of each of those categories listed. Um, and then we will share that back with the student. We'll email it back to them, as well as prepare the brochure. We're coming up with, with a variety of ways that we will contact or notify the student of the service. And we um, hope that that will help them accomplish their goal. All right. Moving on down, um, I'll just make note that we were able to um, invite our different faculty, faculty members in both full-time as well as adjuncts that are teaching students in one or more development-led classes. It was our desire to have them to interact one with another and to learn just a little bit about one another. At the same time, we wanted them to know about this uh, tool, this student needs assessment, that we were going to be asking each of them to <coughs> guide the student through uh, getting, opening their email, pulling down this assessment, and doing it in the class. It was about a five to 10 minute uh, assessment students would do online. And that information then with our Center for Research and Community Development have processed the data or process, are processing the data uh, using SurveyMonkey. Okay. And that's the, the last thing I've referenced on here in terms of uh, what we've accomplished is the reception. And that reception we will do again in the fall and the intent is to get our adjuncts and full-time professors interacting, getting to know one another, and sharing some of their expertise. So those are the things that have been accomplished. Now I move to what we're in progress of doing. Tabulating the results of this survey, we um, sent the survey to 1,150 1, students who are enrolled in one or more developmental education courses. As of Friday noon, uh, we had responses back from 597. So we're not through, this is not the type of survey you just want a certain percentage, you want, it's, you want all to respond. So we will be continuing to get a few more students, to get several more students to respond. And I will be making some phone calls. And I might met, make mention that the deans as well as um, our professors in these classes have been very responsive and allowed me to come in to assist, to meet the students, to discuss or share with them what we're trying to do to help them be successful in meeting their goals. Um, I think the other things are pretty much self-explanatory in terms of the best practices uh, workshop that we're working on now is to provide for our faculty members uh, in their evaluations on January Eighth, which I have a copy of their evaluations listed in your packet, they indicated that they would like to have more of an opportunity to interact together and to talk about some instructional strategies from different departments. And so uh, working with Dr. Ben Hayes, we're planning to do a faculty in-service, possibly in March, uh, to address some of the instructional strategies and give them hands-on experience and sharing their expertise. That concludes my report and I'm open to any questions that you may have, and thank you. It was a very comprehensive report, and it was presented, you know, in an outstanding manner. So, yeah. any questions, anyone? I have a couple, and I want to make sure you, you can explain it to me. Yes, ma'am. Because I had two parents that approached me last night. Um, the ACT score of 23, if they score that, <clears throat> although they have good grades, and they score 16 to 17, they still be in remedial classes? I am not sure about yes. the answer to that. Who's, who's responding? Yes, they, they will still be in developmental classes. We, if right. they are testing a um, uh, uh, low score on the AccuPlacer. And the, re the reason that we don't go by their GPA um, is because um, sometimes the GPAs are a little bit inflated 
Uh, I can tell you, for example, in the honors program, we used to admit students with a high GPA into the honors, and they would come in and they would test into developmental level classes. Oh, no. oh, no. So that is an issue. Yep. Okay, so depends on what school you come from, whether that 4.0 was really a 4.0. And I understand that. Okay, so uh, oh, how much is it? Is it $74 a credit hour? Is that what it costs? Uh, is it 74 or 75 what's, what's our? $75 per hour. 75. 75. Oh, this is even worse. Okay, <laughs> if we got, okay, so if they take 20 hours, it would cost them 1480 bucks. So one of the mothers was close to it. Okay. Um, I, I just got to get ready because this is a basic question I get asked mm -hmm. all the time. My son or my daughter has a 3.5, 3.8. Mm -hmm. Why are they taking these classes? I'm saying, well, they should have learned this in high school. Yes. But they are saying, well, they didn't have this class in high school. Well, then you have to pay us 74, 75, whatever it is, dollars to, to take this class. Well, that'll use up half of their pay up. Well, it will use up half their pay up. And if we got 1,150 kids, you said, that are in the remedial classes, mm -hmm. now, mm -hmm. and if they had to take all 20 hours of remedial classes, uh, not all of no. them have to take all 20 hours. Brenda. Okay, so it's very few of them have to take the, what they take. It depends on where Nine they test. or six or yeah. is it a low number or is it a big number? Do we it, know what the average uh, is? What's the average? The average number of hours that people in Do the you know the hours? average? Yes, yeah. the average hours is six. Six. And okay. Traditionally, it's a math. It's math versus yeah. the reading. The reading. Yeah. Uh, so that's where the bulk of the students are in the the math area of their deficiency. Now, there are a couple of things I can respond to that might help you help your uh, constitu our constituency. And that would be that we are really looking close to offering students some type of what we call boot camp in preparation for taking our placement test. Because students take that placement test as they come to enroll, they really don't give it a great attention. They just mark all kinds of ways. In fact, a good example of that is I had two students that were enrolled in my reading class and I went to the honors program and they were being honored as an honor students. And I asked them, how did you get in my reading class and now you're being honored at the honors, school, honor pro, honors program? And their response was, oh, I didn't take the AccuPlace serious. I didn't know it was gonna really in count. <laughs> so the point I'm trying to make is oftentimes our students really do not take the placement test very serious and they do not perform very well. They find themselves enrolled in developmental education courses, which still is a help to them in terms of structure, about how to learn and how to organize your information, but they are not necessarily the students that need to be there. So, but we are serving a variety of students with different diverse needs, and their preparation oftentimes is not strong, and they do need the, the benefit of the course. And the second point I want to make is about the profile link that we're doing with the students. Not only do we look at the students in terms of when they come into our, our college and are enrolled in the developmental education courses, we want to look at it from a long-term point of view in terms of how well do they do as they continue on into the curriculum and complete their various degrees. And we're hoping to be in a position to say that those students that get a strong foundational support, that they will they will be remained in the program, matriculate through the program, and that they will graduate or meet their goal. So it's not just assessing in terms of a profile, what are they doing while they're in developmental ed, but what are they doing as they go through our curriculum com and complete their degree or certificate or whatever their goal is that they came to accomplish. I hope that will help you speak with your constituents. Actually, actually uh, you uh, the vice president and you have just clarified what has been brought to the board. And, uh, Trustee Flunder, you, you might recall, uh, the Acker Placer is, is actually a, a better uh, assessment of college readiness. And so that's, and then uh, we're changing mm -hmm. uh, to uh, Compass, which is even going to be more uh, applicable and, and have continuity across uh, community colleges. And also, uh, school districts uh, in Wyandotte County are now looking at what they, uh, what's termed explore at the middle uh, level and, and taking the ACT 
uh, all of the high school students uh, because it is a more accurate depiction of how well a, a student is doing than their GPA. Also, a number of districts are changing their, in the midst of changing their curriculum. Uh, so there is a, a transition going on there. And so that's going uh, to a more rigorous uh, curriculum to prepare uh, for college. And so uh, <clears throat> what parents need to be looking at is not so much the GPA, but what are the results of their Explore and their ACT. And uh, we already know what the target uh, should be uh, 23 higher uh, certainly over 20 uh, for certain if you're below that then you know you have some challenges that need to be addressed and they would know this as early as uh, seventh grade in some districts mm -hmm. certainly eighth in most uh, it, locally so uh, that's what we need to be communicating uh, to uh, the community is education has changed and uh, uh, it's becoming much more complex. And we you have problem solvers and, and critical thinkers. No longer are we looking for our employers looking for people to just have the right answer. It is right there. Uh, you pass the test. Uh, that's not what it's about. It's about uh, being able to be creative mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that. So uh, it's just uh, all of us getting used to a new paradigm. Mm -hmm. uh, it, I think that uh, uh, we're off to a very good a good start. I did mention to the Vice President, I just wanted to say to you, uh, in the Advisory Council, I see that it is uh, uh, our internal people, good people, mm -hmm. um, but uh, sometimes w you know, you, what that expression is, you can't, can't see the trees for the forest. Mm -hmm. uh, and we might want to uh, have a couple of members, and I don't know if it necessarily needs to be school district people, but maybe uh, some of the uh, universities that we have uh, reciprocal uh, uh, agreements with uh, UMKC has a developmental center. So what mm -hmm. what are they learned? What are you know something? So maybe we could get somebody from there to be on here to assist. Uh, just as the uh, uh, faculty have uh, requested, well, what are the instructional strategies that others uh, know of and, mm -hmm. and possess? That's, that's very rich, and I applaud them for reaching out. And I because it is important that this not just be looked at upon as a silo. Well, this is where we take care of the students that uh, have some challenges. Mm -hmm. Fact is, there are going to be uh, students in all of our courses that are going to have some challenges. And we have to be uh, instructionally capable of assisting the students in meeting those challenges. And the way you do that is by working together and figuring it out. So uh, I applaud. I applaud you and your efforts to this point. Thank you. I applaud you, but I, you got your work cut out. Oh, absolutely. Because one student at one particular high school made 23, and all the rest of them is 19 and below. Mm -hmm. And they're all seniors. Mm -hmm. So it's right, like right now. Mm -hmm. So I applaud you. You can encourage you. You really got your work cut out. People do not, especially since we're having so much problems with the Pell Grant, mm -hmm. if they're going to use all of it up taking remedial classes, mm -hmm. they're not going to have anything left. Uh, it, and they're tightening down on us for the student loans. It's coming. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to be sure that you get a copy of what I brought back from D.C. Because I'm going to hand it to you right now. Oh. Hi. Okay. Thank well. We do, if the average is uh, six hours um, at $75, that's $450. The average uh, Pell is $2,800. So that leaves almost $2,400 uh, left for the uh, students in their Pell grant. I would disagree that this is taken, but the, and we have to give this, the students what they need. Yeah. If they need this to be successful, then uh, we uh, need to uh, supply it, I guess is the term, I, uh, to deliver, deliver it because success is what's most important. Uh, you you want to get what you pay for. Uh, and, and I think that this community college does an excellent job in being very tangible of, of producing results and products that, in fact, you do get more than what you pay for. 
And so uh, I think that it still is an incredible bargain, and I, again, applaud this institution for recognizing that our students need as more assistance in being successful because the goal is success of everyone who enters here and wanting an education. And if I might add, Trustee Flunder, if we allow students who are testing into developmental classes, no, let me finish. The boat. Both, yeah, yeah. yeah. That if we allow them to take college level classes I before they're they ready, go. we're setting them up for failure. I and in the long run, that. that'll cost them. I and the research that. tells us students who test into developmental and successfully go through the sequence will graduate at a much higher rate than students who come to the college, college ready. I so understand every bit of that. You all are not understanding me. I'm saying I pay my taxes. I pay my real estate taxes, all of them. That's what the lady told me last night. She says, I pay them school taxes that Ellison was talking about. You all also get part of my taxes that I pay for my real estate. She says, why do I have to pay? I, my kids go to school, five, school district 500. Okay, then like I told her, one of the things she could do is go to 500 school board meetings and demand that they improve theirs to bring them up so she won't have to pay us to teach them something they should have learned in high school. So you all are missing the boat because we are, we're still the same taxpayer. She's the same person. She's not no different. They don't get down there and separate their money. And he spoke of all four school districts. So it's like we're the bad guys, and they the good guys. They need to bring their standard up, teach them what they're supposed to know, so when they get here, we won't have to have that many classes. That's a lot of students in remedial reading. Well, and I still say that. OK. Um, thank you for that input and I, I just want to encourage you to know that we are really working hard on this boot camp I know we entity. are we worked hard on it well I what I'm saying what I'm saying to you is that we're trying to find funding to support uh, the students before they actually are admitted into our institution or while they're in that process okay. and preparing on that uh, AccuPlace is a review for some and for some it's the first time they've been exposed to the information and it's not any of our, you know, we, no one can take a blame for that. It's just the way it is. But what we're trying to do is to support the student and get the student to understand this is a very important assessment. It determines the direction of your life in terms of a career. It also determines the amount of money you're going to spend to get your education and how long you're going to be here at this institution or whether you ever go to another institution based upon your performance. Because we're mindful of that, we're looking for ways to try to help the student be better prepared and to take the exam far more serious in terms of their placement. Okay. But thank you. Dr. Dr. Kelly, we're going to also have to work on professional school goers. Oh, that is very true. <laughs> and they're going to be weeded out as we look at the profiles of our students. Okay. But thanks again. You're going to have thank to you. really work on them. I have a question. <laughs> yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Dr. Kelly, yes, uh, the in-service workshop that you had on January the 8th, uh, during the breakout session, there were eight questions that were reviewed by that group. Uh, is there a transcript of the responses? Uh, there, there is, and it has been prepared. Would you like to be uh, emailed it? We're Please. going to send it to all of the faculty members. Um, uh, yes, and you will be very appreciative of what you get from that. So I will email that to you if yeah. that's okay. Appreciate you send it. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you.